Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is actress Sandra Singh Lowe. I went to a press junket put on by the distributors of uh, Cowboy Booking International for an independent film called West Bay Root. I taped an interview with the writer-director Ziad Dariri, who was born in Beirut and came to the United States to study film at the University of San Diego and also at UCLA. Ziad was trained as a camera person and actually worked on all of Quentin Tarantino's movies. West Beirut is Ziad's first film and it's a very uh, loosely structured autobiography. His younger brother is the star of the film. We're going to show you a clip of uh, his impressions of Beirut, what he remembered when he was living there as a young boy. So after that, we'll come back and you'll see the interview of uh, Ziad right after the clip. and left Lebanon when you were 20. Was the war still going on? When I left, yeah, it was peaking, actually. What, how did you get out? It, just very simple. I mean, it was not like... Lebanon was not a country where, like, you cannot leave. I just, you know, bought a KLM ticket. It was one way. I told my parents that I'll be gone and probably not coming back. Oh, you left your family behind. I left, yeah. I came to study film in, in, in California. So. I see. Who was fighting, actually, in the war? Uh, it's actually a lot of people were fighting. <laughs> 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 I'm even having a hard time understanding it. But basically, it was right-wing militia versus left-wing militia. <clears throat> it happens that the right-wing were predominantly Christian, uh. and the left-wing were predominantly Muslim. But that's not completely black and white either. I mean, there were Christian fighting here, and, and so it I was... I know. I never understood it. When I was in Beirut, I still saw the Green Line. I didn't understand what the Green Line was dividing. What mm -hmm. was it dividing? It was actually dividing the right-wing Christian part of the city from the <clears throat> Muslim left-wing part of the city. And when we, you were living there, mm -hmm. obviously there was a green line. Absolutely. Did you obey it, or did you just wander around? No, we, uh, we could not cross to the other side. I have not stepped in East Beirut during this entire period. Ah. I stayed always in West Beirut, because you couldn't cross. I mean, mm -hmm. some people managed to cross, but it we could not. It was just know. a line, though, right? It, it's, like, it's like as wide as Pico Boulevard. <laughs> I swear to God, it's exactly what oh, it is. Yeah. 
and it just seemed miles away, but it's just such a tiny street. When did you get the idea of making a film about the war? Uh, I've been writing memoirs for quite a while when I came to the United States. And then uh, it just kept on building up more and more. I've been just writing more scenes and more certain things that were happening. The most pleasant actually were these recollections of memoir. Mm -hmm. Until uh, I finished work on a film called uh, Four Rooms and I've made I've like saved enough money. I said, you know what? I can take six months off without working. Well, so. <clears throat> is your film West Beirut autobiographical? Um, it, for the big majority of it, it is almost an exact duplicate of the same event that happened. So, and the film was filmed in Beirut. Yeah, completely. There? Yeah, Com from yeah, we filmed it entirely in Beirut. Um, was that the first time you'd been back? First time. Well, since how I left. Did you find it? Look, you know, I went back and like I don't want to sound too dramatic, but the first like 48 hours, you're kind of like your tears don't stop. You you're crying all the time because you just says I left this place for 14 years and then suddenly everything comes back. It's been registered like the smell of the city, the noises of the city, the religious chanting Sunday morning, you know, mm. the mosque or the church bells, everything is there. It all came back. And, and, and then you come from a very quiet city like Santa Monica <laughs> to a very noisy town. So it was very emotional. It's very beautiful actually. Did you go back just to film? Yeah. Or did, oh, just to film, not just to, to film. see family? Or? Well, I mean, my family is there, but I have not visited them. They used to come here. Oh, they were coming here? They came three times to visit, uh -huh. but I was not there, but I came to film. Oh, yeah. When you got to Beirut, did the government know you were there? And Absolutely. Oh, they did? So oh, yeah. it was all cleared and it was okay? Completely. They just knew you were making a film about the war? Yeah, and they said, whatever you need. I said, well, I need everything you can give me, and they did. Did they? Did you take crew with you? I took American crew and a French crew and Lebanese crew, yeah. We had a multi, you know, three countries. And what was the budget? The budget was actually pretty small. Uh, we were looking for two million to do this film and we ended up with $800,000 to do it. You mean it was easier once you got there? It just got easier to work? No, it, it got more difficult because I was running out of money. Oh, you were right. <laughs> Did you get money in, in uh, Beirut? The money, own, the entire amount of money came from France. It came from France yeah. because it's because, a big uh, banking company. Well, because the Lebanese always go back to their old, old mother. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, you know, we have to knock on their doors. The money couldn't come from the States and it couldn't come from Beirut. You seemed fascinated just like the young boy in the film with 8 millimeter. Or eight, uh, Super 8. Super 8. Yeah. I like Super 8, but you know what? It's funny because I used Super 8 uh, not in, in Beirut, but in college here studying film. Oh, that's how you learned? That's how I learned about the Super 8. But I said, you know, might as well I use this as a vehicle to tie the film together. I see, I see. And you know, some of that footage with Hafif Assad and mm -hmm. Ara, where did you get that? I, that, I got it from archives. I got it from Moshe Dayan, Assad, and. That was so incredible to right. see that. It I was had a, to. A period that right. wasn't. Uh, there. One thing before we finish the interview, the music was so great. Did you find an Arabic composer to do that music? No, it was actually a very big American composer who did it. <laughs> an American composer? Oh yeah, Stuart Copeland did the music actually. So. How did you find him and why? I just he... knocked on his door. I said I knew his music previously. I knew he did the Rumblefish and Wall Street and talk radio and all the. And I loved his music tremendously. And I knocked on his door. I says, uh, my name is Ziad and I from Lebanon, and I knew he lived 10 years in Lebanon, too. Oh, so that's where he had that Arabic soul. He had, yes, and I gave him the scenario, and he says, let me read it. So he read it two weeks later, he called me, he says, look, what do you want? I says, I want you to do it. He says, I'll do it. And he did it for free, actually. Because so. the music, when, in the end, when the uh, when they were playing the oud, right. it just took you year after right. year after year. No, I, he was very cool about it. The other thing, will you go back to Lebanon now to make another film, or will all your filmmaking be in... Uh, no, I... <laughs> The, the next one happens mainly in Washington, D.C., but uh, I will always go back and visit now. I kind of like this place, actually. Uh, you like America or... I like Britain? both, actually. <laughs> I, I'm, I was like, I have one leg here and one leg there. Good. Thanks cool. very well, much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Ziad is so in love with California and the similarities to Lebanon that he has settled in Santa Monica and says he's going to stay there for a long time. Don't go away. We'll be right back with Sandra Singh Lowe.
Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with writer performer Sandra Singh Lowe, who's won women's shows Bad Sex with Bud Kemp and Aliens in America, played at the Tiffany Theater in West Hollywood and at off Broadway theaters in New York. Sandra's won all kinds of awards for writing. Well, she's written everything novels, short stories, plays, TV episodes, screenplays, and she's a commentator on National Public Radio and a composer. <laughs> what came first in your life, your acting career or your writing career? Boy, well, um, I'm not sure I've had a career <laughs> either. <laughs> so, so I think I'm still looking for a career. Uh, but um, I actually got my undergraduate degree in physics. Then I went to USC in English, and then I wrote sort of record reviews and was a performance artist in my 20s, again, which I, I wouldn't use the word career. I, to me, career is like getting paid for what you do. Uh, so <laughs> performance art, you know, so I did that for a while. So, and then I did cabaret shows with piano for a while, and then I decided in my late 20s I needed to find a way to earn a living, so I went to magazine writing and whatever, so then I was a writer. So, yeah. this, is the, this is your whole career in a nutshell. Yeah, right? that's pretty much it. And here you are. Yeah, and now I'm 69 years old, so yeah. <laughs> Sandra, did physics actually, physics, I mean, is that what an actor uses, physics, or did you use it in composing, or? No, I didn't use it at all. I don't remember <laughs> it, any physics. I only went into it because my father's a scientist, and so, and he's Chinese, so everybody of, you know, a Asian kids all have to study science, so that's why I did it, but I, I, I didn't learn anything. Did you uh, take journalism classes? No. Did you take acting classes? Uh, no. How did you start performing? You you did this one funny thing that I read about um, on the Harbor Freeway. Right. And that was in my performance <laughs> right. art days where I played piano on the Harbor Freeway at rush hour. Uh, and and it, was, it was actually based on a play that I had written about a stand-up comic who can't find any audience in L.A. So he goes to where there are captive audiences. You know, there's commuters. They're strapped into their cars. They're not going anywhere uh, so that he would take his act to them. And then I thought it would be a good performance art piece, but nobody that I ask would do it. You know, so they wanted me, as they said, if it's your idea, you have to do it. So I ended up doing it. So you did it. Right. In the but Fringe could Festival. people hear you? Could yes, because I had huge Marshall <laughs> stacks. I had one third of the um, sonic power they have at U2 concerts. So you'd see a pianist and then these big Marshall stacks on both sides blasting out this music. So and you were nice. actually there? Yes. Well, what's this other thing that you did, spawning fish? Right, and that what was that? when um, I hired a 37-piece orchestra to serenade some spawn and grunion at midnight. Oh, oh, you know, I think I remember that. That's yeah. right, playing the fish in. Right. Everyone went <laughs> right, so it was kind of a ritual, sort of an Easter spring ritual of, like, giving a mating song to these fish. But grunion hunting yes. is what it basically was, right? Right, right. Yes, exactly. But you made but it well, into... people weren't hunting the grunion that day. Oh, they weren't? Right, it was just about the fish. It was sort of politically uh, incorrect to hunt them at that point. Oh, it was at yeah. that point? Okay. And, and, yeah, and I did that piece. It cost about uh, $4,000 out of my own pocket. It was the end of an inheritance that I'd gotten, and then I realized I had to stop oh. doing performance art pieces for free or figure some way to bring in money, to make art that bring in money. Well, aspect. what happened? Like, were people afraid, actually, to take a chance on you? I mean, they recognized that you had this kind of excitement going on about the things you were doing, but yeah. did they pull back and were they afraid to, to invest in you? Well, I think you would be, have to be crazy <laughs> to invest in a performance artist because since all my <laughs> events were free, there was no way to make money back. And that I would get called a lot from <laughs> colleges or places to go, we have a festival that we want attention to publicity, press to be drawn to our festival. Ah. So for no money, will you come to our thing and dangle your you know, piano from a helicopter and to bring, you know. so I got lots of offers to do things, but there was never any money. How many of those them. did you do? I mean, that really. I didn't do any of oh. those types. <laughs> I, I did three of my own that I thought were cool ideas that I wanted to see. And then, and then I just started taking the phone off the hook for the other things because, you know. So you didn't take any journalism classes, but you've written for the New York Times, the LA Times, right. Buzz, Vogue, Self. You've written all yeah, kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And memory. how did you? Ah, yeah. thank you. I, uh, well, I started writing <laughs> record reviews for the LA Weekly um, right around uh, in the late '80s when Jonathan Gold oh, I, I was the music editor then for a brief while. Um, so I wrote record, you know, record reviews, and then how from did there, they find you? How did you find them? Jonathan and I were oh. in a composers and an avant-garde <laughs> composers collective 
collective called the Independent Composers Association. Um. So he did a lot of compositions for like eight cellos at once. So we were both sort of avant-garde composers together, and we would just chat sometimes, and he just felt that probably, you know, my voice would be good to write these tiny record reviews. Oh, the so, he, oh so that's yeah. how so he actually gave me my first job. But like you play cello? No, he did. Oh, <laughs> But he always had a lot of cello stuff going, yeah. And what did you play? Flute. Piano. Oh, <laughs> flute, too. Didn't you play flute on stage? Uh, I'm sure I've played Aliens everything on stage. in America. Stage. What did you play on stage? Did I play a flute? I don't no, think I I'm did. just pre I'm pretending you hmm. use the flute. Yeah. Because I'm pretending because I saw you doing things that were so incredible on oh, stage. Oh, I talked in the phone a lot. You talked in the phone. See, that's kind of fluty. But they move you around the stage. Yes. Your director is incredible. David Schweitzer is very incredible. So let's talk about. Um, should we talk about National Public Radio first and then talk about Aliens Sure, in let's do that. Um, which is actually, <laughs> I was on Morning Edition National Public Radio. Actually, now I'm on Public Radio International. So so this American Life Ira Glasses show is on Public Radio International and Marketplace is on PRI. So they so. can hear you all over the country? Right, exactly. Even further? International, do you think they Probably they up? can. You know, there's a lot of weird web stuff that's going on out there that people in all countries can get on the web and hear stuff on KCRW. So technically they could. So how did you decide um, to go on the radio? How did they find you for that? Uh, let's see. Right when Buzz Magazine was going, Ruth Seymour and Alan Mayer were friends. So I think uh. that Buzz gave you know some free trade to case her free ads. And we'll take and Sandra then, free. Well, no, and, and then and then Ruth Seymour like gave one of those little <coughs> Wednesday night at six fifty five slot for every Buzz columnist to rotate through and read their column. Oh. So there were about eight or ten of us, and so oh. we rotated through every Wednesday. Somebody else would do it, and then Buzz eventually went the way of the. Etc. And uh, K and then KCRW. I think every few years, Ruth Seymour just like to shake up her lineup, and so she just called me one day and said, "You want to take one of these slots?" And so that's that was it. Yeah. Are you still doing it? I am. You Two are. and a half years later. Yeah. You've got so many deadlines. Are you every still, week. Are you still writing for magazines? Uh, not very. Basically, not if I can help it. I'll do it an occasional essay here and there, like once every six months, if it's really good. But uh, since I do a radio commentary, I don't have, I don't need a venue to express myself because I express myself oh, yeah. anyway. So, and the money, com money is not that great in magazines, especially if stuff gets killed. So, you know, little so movie writing, this. radio. Yeah. All right, let's go to aliens. All right. Here. You, as I say, your director moved you around that stage. Yeah. I mean, it was choreographed to the nth yeah. degree. But the thing that I thought was so fabulous was the stage set with those Chinese takeout containers. Right. Does everyone get that right away? Because I like don't know they do. And, and right, and so it's, so it's a Jasper Johns type flag, all <laughs> white. That's made out. Yeah, Chinese takeout. Uh, containers and the revolving stage in the middle, and, the re and then the bamboo, right? Shape and the bamboo behind. shape. So there's a lot of stuff, and I think that was like David Schweitzer, who is so brilliant, and I love him. <laughs> That's like his vision to make it. I think when I did the show a few years ago, when I started working on it, sometimes there's a little bit of hesitancy to be politically incorrect, you know. To but now, as of it's 1999, like the millennium's always over. So his instinct is to go as politically incorrect as possible. And I love think, that. I think it's great. Can you do it? Do you do it? You can. You can do it. Absolutely. Because, if, absolutely. Because also, I think, like, with my father, his characterization is very broad. He's like an old Mandarin. And it's kind of like, but my father uses his old Mandarin shtick to get the stuff that he needs. And everybody in this place completely stereotypically broad, whatever, but they're using that to get something else. So I think it's time for people of any particular color to reclaim their own. I mean, that there, there are, you know, people are unique within their cultures, and they do different things. And that's interesting, and whether you're from the South or from Nebraska or from you know France or whatever, you've all got something that you and do. And you can recognize it yourself, and it's always been that you could say it yourself, but no one else could yeah. say it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I do three things. I do a very broad Chinese guy, I do a very broad German person that's my mom, and then it's a very broad Southern California like Valley Girl. I'm like, ah, oh, thing that was me. And these are just types. These are just regional types. You use? Did you take voice lessons? I've had a little bit of voice training just to make sure that I don't lose my voice in a run. Yeah. During dur for when you're on right. stage, but right. you didn't need it for the radio. You didn't use it for radio. Mm, no, it's just kind of like I think it, it has changed. Uh, you know, over the last 
two and a half years that I just started reading it differently. If you just go there every week and read something, you'll start to write copy that's easier to say. And but the, so. the thing that I noticed um, during Aliens in America is you use your voice loud, right. soft, you move, the movement right. um, takes the audience, it, but the way you are generating going up and down. Right. Uh, yeah, and I think all those... I mean, that's <coughs> all, of course, deliberately d directed. Yeah, I mean, it's a combination of things. I think working with David is more, and I think that's why he's a great, great solo performance director, he more gives you the tools and the techniques and the stuff to fly the plane, but he'll let you fly it any way you want. So I think when I'd done Bad Sex with him in New York, I mean, last year I did like 75 performances, and I'm going to do like 100 in five months or whatever. And so it's kind of like you're more like a pilot in a cockpit, and you're learning to do different kinds of things. You know, like the most obvious thing is if you want to really draw people's attention, don't go louder. Drop your voice. Oh, so, but, and you right. use those. And yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that we've shtick, we've worked out. Well, let's talk about some of the different parts of the play. Right. Because mm -hmm. I think Chinese Wives won you an award. Yes. Yes, a, a literary award. Yeah, it's in the Norton Anthology this year in a Pushcart Prize and stuff like that. So the original story that that's based on, yeah. Tell us about that part of it. Well, let's see, that's a story <laughs> about my father, who's right now 79, Chinese, and that in his old age, he'd been married to a German woman. In his old age, he kind of reverts to with ethnicity and marries a bunch of male-order Chinese wives. A bunch? Well, two. <laughs> that's a but bunch. But he auditioned many more than that. But that's a lot. He married two of them. He's still married to one of them. And so, <coughs> so the whole thing is the reaction, really, between three characters, me, my sister, and my father. My sister, who's totally sarcastic and totally... He kind of does his foreign charm shtick, and none of us buy it at all because we know he's hiding behind that facade to just be real cheap and stuff like that. So um, that's that particular. Is she really like that, your sister? Is she she's sarcastic? a little bit like that, but she's but she's very sarcastic, but she's very funny <laughs> and very warm too. But in the play, I do her a little bit more stiff just to make her different. How does she feel? Does she come and watch you on stage? Yeah, she's seen it a lot <laughs> and, and basically I think she's tickled if she get if her character gets off a line and the audience laughs. Ah. Then she kind of likes it, but then sometimes she feels a little uncomfortable. So this is an ongoing thing between us. And I also named her something different in the play and just to make it it's kind of fictional, but kind of this, and kind, you know, to yeah. use the essential parts of that, but fictionalize the it. The other thing, the, talking about your sister, then I wondered how your father felt, because I think you poke the most fun at your father. My father is a complete ham, and as I, I actually did a commentary on this, I think two days ago on KCRW, so on opening night, he arrives three hours early with a full-on, full-length <laughs> Mandarin costume oh, you're and a hat with a button on it that he plans to wear while seated front row center during my opening night. Oh, so you know, just in case any of the attention should fly to me. He does yeah. love it. He, ta <laughs> he uh, you know, he, you don't even want to go there. Yeah, oh, he totally does. He would come on stage and take a bow after it sometimes and he get has? flowers. Oh, yeah, he, yeah, totally. He's all over it. Well, it's so funny because you make such terrible fun of him. It's a joke all yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, he's so clever yeah. in the way he uses himself is what I think exactly. you're saying exactly. more than anything else. Exactly. It's like, dumb? No. Exactly. <laughs> wily and inscrutable. He is the wily old man. So that may have been very difficult to write. It was difficult to write. Actually, for about six or seven years, I, try, I, I had really difficulty writing it because I was writing all these stories about hip sort of urban women with dating problems and whatever. And so I had a kind of voice that I like to use and a kind of depth, irony and stuff. And it was so hard to tell the story in that sort of ironic voice because it's so outlandish. So when I just started telling the story at the top, my father has decided to do this thing. Then it started working better just to simply tell the story and not comment. You think Which is basically is, how it's come out. But you still um, are making fun. Yes. You're still making fun and yes. yet it's very straight. Yes. Does the audience always laugh? I mean, I was there. Yes. We were all dying. Laughter. They, 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 they always they get do. Afraid? They always do laugh. Yeah, and I think there's sometimes a fearful thing <coughs> where you can tell with audiences because it is so politically correct right at the top of that thing. Exactly. And some people hook right into it and they just get it. And some people are kind of smiling, but they go because in David Schweitzer's direction, I'll say, my father has decided to marry a woman who's Chinese. Gong! And then David <laughs> Schweitzer is like, gong! And you're like, but that is the way if you're like, it's like to me, oh, the people are coming over, their relatives, they're Chinese. Oh my God. So it's so political. So some people just get a little scared. They get on the train eventually where they realize it's okay and that I'm parodying the way that Chinese rel immigrants speak such horrible English that I think they're afraid, but they get on it eventually. But, but you, 
but yeah. you're doing it about yourself. Right. So it's okay. Right. But still, what I'm saying is sometimes the audience is a little bit afraid Absolutely. to laugh because even right. though you're doing it about yourself, right. am I, you know, you look around. Yeah. But they're so funny. I yeah. mean, the things you and do. There's sig yeah, and there's signals that I try to do to bring them in or to, yeah. But, but yeah, sometimes people are just a little And then you, you don't only attack the Chinese, you attack the Germans. Yes. <laughs> Everyone is attacked. Attack everyone. Everyone's attacked. And you attack the Germans because of your mother, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the German tourists. Yeah, whose idea of somewhere exotic was to go to Africa and take a photograph of a carcass. So And the yeah. Ethiopian part, the right. trip. Right. The Ethio yeah, and the second piece is called Ethiopian Vacation when my mother takes us in the sixties on a fabulous sort of Bali high luxury cruise vacation to Ethiopia because my father's cheap and she wants adventure. So is that's it her really compromise. true? Did you really go yes, to Ethiopia? Yes, we did. Actually that story the first two stories are almost entirely true. And the, then you take some uh License. Yes. And then there are a little bit of license. And then the third story, which is me Musk. as a teenager, yeah, oh, 19 right. years old, going to a hot tub party and <laughs> not knowing quite how to behave, is unfortunately, sadly, based on an incident that occurred to me when I was 33 years old. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you, know what I mean? you always have the gawky teen freak inside you. I'd go to a party tomorrow in LA and completely screw up. So that's unfortunately based on something quite a bit later than that. What about works in progress before we finish the time? Uh, well, my radio commentary every week, which is exhausting, but I'm working on a book called A Year in Provence. Provence crossed out. Van Nuys. So like a year in Van Nuys. So it's kind of, uh, you know, Are you take up doing those, those on the radio now? Yeah. And some of it is stuff, radio stuff. So it's kind of like an almanac of a year of living in L.A. with the seasons. So will this be the next thing we'll see on stage? I don't know if it'll go on stage. <laughs> I'm going to try it as a book first. Okay. One of the things you said was that your mother was a nonstop talker. Yes. So thank goodness she was because you have been a nonstop talker Exactly. Today. <laughs> exactly. Thanks for coming on, Thanks, Sandra. Joe. And uh, don't go away. You can go away, but come back next time and keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 40th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.